This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Yo, it's the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. I hope everybody's having a great week. We have another Awesome guests lined up for this week's episode. Basically talking to the top smallmouth anglers across the country. Diving deep, learning techniques, things that they use on a regular basis to catch some big smallmouth. And my guest this week is Kyle Carpenter. We're going to be bringing him on in just a little bit. I want to talk about our sponsors. Of course, the Real Shot Tackle Store located in Northeast Wisconsin. Huge selection of baits. All kinds of stuff. Websites, therealshot.com. You can find that information in the show notes. And we're actually going to give a little discount code for everybody who's listening. Smallmouth Crush 15. That's right. Smallmouth Crush 15. 15% off your first order at The Real Shot. Can't go wrong. I think they got free shipping and everything else. So head on over to The Real Shot for all your bass tackle needs i think we got kyle now he just joined us i'm gonna bring him on there he is what's up travis what's going on so kyle and i go back quite a ways i tried to sell my first bass boat back in the day yeah. that thing was nice i, I made it. sure to have him come over and look at it in the dark <laughs> what happened that thing was a pile of shit well <laughs> Yeah, at that time, I didn't quite understand that you can't run in fiberglass boats over rocks and stuff like that, you know. They leave a mark. Yeah. And had a few marks. <laughs> that thing was awesome. It was, what was it, red and gold, right? Red and black. Red, red and black. black. The gold one was after that one. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember one of the nastiest thing. color bass boats you could ever own. That thing was ugly. It was ugly. There's a lot. There's a cool story about that boat, actually. The guy, the guy that bought it from you, the first time he took it out, the lower unit fell off. Just like that. Yeah. First time he had it out on the water in Shawano Lake, he threw it up on plane, shut down, and the lower unit fell right off. Wow. What can I say? What can you say at this point? So, Kyle, you live in Green Bay or from the Green Bay, Wisconsin area, so you fish big bodies of water, a lot of inland lakes, of course, the Great Lakes Bay of Green Bay. You've been fishing smallmouth forever. You do pretty well in local tournaments uh, across the region. And you got a lot going on now. I know you actually work for The Real Shot or one of their affiliate businesses. I don't know what you would call it. Uh, you want to talk about your background, where you came from, where, what, what's your plans, what you're doing now, and then we'll get into uh, how you consistently catch some of these big smallmouth. Yeah, I'm from Green Bay area. Grew up uh, in Oneida, a little town right outside of Green Bay. I uh, went to high school in a again another little town outside of Green Bay in Seymour, Wisconsin. Um, never really got into fishing at all as a kid. Fished a little bit here and there with some family members and my family was big into racing when I was growing up and local dirt track racing and did some traveling and fishing wasn't really on the radar at all. It was just uh-huh. there. I did it with some family members like I said and um, the racing thing got old really fast when I realized how thankless of a, of a job that is to work your full-time job out once I got out of high school and still work on the race car and everything going along with it. And I just lost that passion. And mm-hmm. I had a, a gentleman I was working with at Dean Distributing at the time, Wayne Wazerick, that was a, he had just won the Sturgeon Bay Open. He, you know, he's a big tournament fisherman, very successful his whole life, his whole career. And he was he got me into it. He invited me actually to come fishing with him, practicing for the Sturgeon Bay Open up on the bay. And I was fishing a little bit by then and nothing serious. And Uh that day when we went up there, that hooked me 100%. Actually, he actually blew his motor up that day. Okay. I actually just remembered that. Uh, We fished all day on the flats in Sturgeon Bay and catch him on a jerk bait. And it was probably the first fish I ever caught on a jerk bait. And I, I was hooked. It was just sure. He had me hooked on a smallmouth from then until now. And between then and now, I've fished, like you said, a lot of local stuff, 
uh, made a couple state teams for Wisconsin. You know, the, the traveling tournament game was never really my thing. I, I like the bodies of water that I live right next to, and that's Green Bay. So I, sure. I don't see a reason to travel around the country as much. But, you know, as I get older and more established now, I, I'm getting that desire back a little more to travel around and, and fish some more bigger tournaments. Sure. So now you're actually working at the Real Shot. What are your uh, responsibilities there? So I actually work for Fix Fix Media, which okay. owns the Real Shot is the mother company to Fix Media Head to Head Fishing. Um, so I'm the brand manager for Head to Head Fishing and Fix Media, um, gotcha. tournament director for all the events, uh, do all the planning, basically everything that goes behind the scenes of tournament fishing is what I do for head to head fishing. Not just myself. We have a, a big support staff here that, that helps me out, but that's what I do full time. Now I left my, my job in March of 2020 and came on board here and been doing this full time. Sure. Almost March will be a year. So head to head fishing, that's a whole new concept that if people are interested, they can uh, just head over to, what is it? Head to head fishing.com. H to H fishing.com. Yep. Everything is on there. Um, this isn't smallmouth related, but check out the walleye league. Um, anybody that knows bass fishing knows about the bass nation. We basically took the bass nations format and, and plan and brought it into the walleye world. So we're growing grassroots ground up type opportunity for anglers. So check that out. It's called the walleye league. You can see that on our website as well. And now you run your own tournament organization as well. Want to talk about that? Yeah, Brent to call me and myself own Wisco Bass Single Series. Uh, we started it in 2019. This will be our third year. Uh, 2020 will be our third year. It's been very, very successful here in Wisconsin. Uh, the last two years, we had six events each year. Our first year, we averaged 57 boats. Our second year, we had averaged 97. So it, it was a great sophomore season for Wisco. That format, you fish alone. You know, you, 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 it's up to yourself. Travis, you came and fished one on Sturgeon Bay, and I yep. I believe you were a bridesmaid in that event, weren't you? Yep, second place to yeah. a guest that we're going to have on the podcast later tonight, Gary. Yeah, that's that's a guy when <laughs> you go to the Bay, you're going to expect to expect him to get a check. So sure. it's tough to beat in the spring year-round out on the Bay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, w Wisco Bass has been awesome. Gary's actually our, actually our anger of the year, and we're going to be taking advantage of the – the package that the real shot offers as our title sponsor. So what did he win with angler of the year? So he won a $6,000 package from the real shot to go fish next level. So after seeing the schedule come out for the opens recently, oh, I shoot, can, he's going to be can, fishing the bass opens in 2021. Yes, he is. I, I'm a student. I haven't confirmed that with Gary yet. We have to, we have to sit down and talk about what he's going to do and what direction he's going to go. But yeah, he won us up to a $6,000 package. He should stick to the centrals to help him with the opens and whatever level he wants to fish. Sure. No, that's awesome. Well, I'm guessing you're going to see him next. Probably. Next I'm sure we'll run into each other. I actually fished a tournament with him last. So it's a funny story. Kyle and I fished a, a small Wednesday night or every time I come back in the spring and we won a tournament a couple of years ago. And then that same tournament, the following year, you couldn't fish for some reason. I ended up fishing with Gary and we won that one too. So yep. uh, it's actually, you know, I enjoy those little weekend yeah, things. And you know, you mentioned you don't travel too much. You fish local events. I'm sure you fish a lot of events on on Sturgeon Bay and Lake Michigan. I know you also really love Beta Knock and the northern stretches of of Lake Michigan as well. And of course, a lot of inland lakes in northern Wisconsin that you explore. Uh, tell me what what do you think is you know, as far as techniques go, if you could just pick one technique or one pattern for smallmouth bass, uh, what would be your favorite way to target those fish? My favorite way or one I had to fish with the rest of my life? Favorite way. We'll get to that one. We'll get to that question. Um, hands down, my favorite way to catch smallmouth is on Alabama rig. There's really? So much, there's so much controversy around it that I just love it. I love I love pulling into a crowd and just chucking a chandelier and turning heads. You know, it's something Gary and I have done to a lot of people and we've had it done to us with other baits. So, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to have that bait dialed in to the point where there's nobody else around catching fish on it and we're 
stroking them is is a great feeling. So I, I certainly want to circle back later in this podcast and talk about the Alabama rig because it is a bait that's thrown quite a bit. It's a bait that's overfished in a lot of places or, or overused, I believe, but still effective. Overused, but underutilized. It seems like you have a a few secrets you'll be able to share with the audience when it comes to a rig fishing. So I definitely want to get into that. So your favorite pattern is throwing the a rig. Uh, is this a a situation where you're throwing the a rig pretty much year round? Uh, is there better times in the year when you're throwing it? What are you, what are your experiences with that? Uh, it's it's year round. You can catch them on on a. 38 degrees roughly is the coldest I've ever caught one in the fall. Uh, spring, as soon as the ice is gone, it's on the deck. It's If I'm fishing for smallmouth, it's it's there. When the fish are deep, they eat it. When they're shallow, they eat it. It's a good search tool. Sometimes you'll just get them to run through it where they won't eat it, but you, you, you locate them. You know, sure. Now with live scope and everything else coming out, just like Garmin live scope, it's such a great way to find fish, to just search for them. Mm-hmm. There's, sure. there's days that I throw it in practice without any hooks on it just to see the fish come up and run through it. Sure, sure. Now, so so fishing in northeast Wisconsin, where would you say your favorite place to fish is? Is it an inland lake? Is it a large body of water? Uh, my favorite is Door County. Okay. Um, if if I'm going to go and I have time and the weather's permitted, I'm going to go to Door County. Uh, there is a lot of great inland lakes in Wisconsin that have giant smallmouth in them. Most of them are with you know, a couple hour drive from Green Bay. So like I said, if if I got time and I'm going and just for fun fishing, it's going to be on the base somewhere, be it, you know, West Shore, East Shore, Lake Michigan side, somewhere in on the base system. Sure, sure. What is your strengths when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Like, you know, you, you love throwing an A-rig, but do you have a particular bait that you know you have pretty much dialed in? Uh, and maybe it is the A-rig. I, I don't want to answer that for you, but Right. Uh, when you when you when you know you're going to be able to fish this technique, you get excited. You think you could put some good fish in the boat. What technique is that? Uh, it's dragon tubes. Um, okay. two, baits, two baits for smallmouth is not a secret at all. Um, for me to sit here and tell you I got it figured out, nobody else does is not true because everybody has them figured out at times. Um, that's just a bait that again everybody throws, but I I don't think people are willing to change the way you need to throw it at times. Okay. Some days you need to drop shot it. You know, sure. some, some days you're not just dragging it on the bottom. You need to swim it. You know, there's so many different presentations you can do with a tube jig that a lot of guys just don't do. So um, what is a typical uh, tube arsenal look like in your boat? Do you have a variety of colors? Are you Do you stick to just a handful? Is there different sizes? Can you walk us, break us down uh, the breakdown of, of your tube box, if you will? So I carry two different boxes. One is... Green pumpkin box, one is dark melon box. They're pretty much shades of them two colors, different flex, different darker, lighter, um, pretty much they're them colors. The base okay. is that color. Some might be a little a little like black I put in with the green pumpkin box. Um, something like a smoke is in with that box. Um, I only really carry two different sizes and that's a a two and three quarter and a three inch slender tube. I call everything a hot dog. I don't throw big tubes. I don't even, I don't even know if I own a tube that I would consider a small mouth type tube anymore. That is not two and three quarter or three inch flipping is different. I got flipping tubes, but sure. uh, for small mouth presentations, I do not carry any big tubes at all anymore. Mm-hmm. And why is that? I I think you just get bit more. Some, there's some places, you know, there's some bodies of water where throwing a three and a half or a four inch tube is effective, but most of the tournaments I fish, the fish are, if there's big fish there, you're going to catch them on that two and three quarter. I feel they don't get snagged up as much. I can feel better with it depending on what weight I put into it. Um, I just, I guess it's just more comfort and, you know, I don't like carrying a whole lot of stuff either. So. Sure. Sure. As far as tube heads and what, what's your typical setup to, um, to rig these tubes? Is it just a standard lead insert? Three eighth ounce up to three eighths. I don't, don't very rarely will I throw anything over three eighths. Um, I I did start to play with some of the bigger three quarter one ounce tubes this year Mm -hmm. and had some success and it's a struggle to try and find one that's small enough to fit in that small tube. Sure. 
just because I'm going to a heavier head doesn't mean I want a bigger tube. So right. I finally found a hook that that works for me to get into that smaller head. And actually this fall up on an inland lake in Wisconsin, we had a lot of fun fishing with three quarter and one ounce tubes in 35 feet of water. You know, and the only reason I went to that is because the fish were, they wanted it stuck to the bottom and it took so long for a quarter ounce or three eighths to get to the bottom, or I just was, I was just impatient. Basically I wanted to get down there and be able to leave it there. Yep. Absolutely. As far as your rod and real setup when you're throwing the tube, uh, can you walk us through that setup as well as the line? So I use, uh, unfortunately I got hooked into the NRX game. Um, <laughs> them rods are unbelievable. I have no ties to G Loomis at all whatsoever. And them rods are phenomenal. I use the 872, I believe it is. It's 7.3 medium extra fast. The extra length of it helps with lighter tubes to be able to cast farther. Uh, some people are dead set on the seven foot and I like the seven three just because that extra little length and the sure. rod still has enough backbone to get them fish on a long cast where you're still going to get a hook into them. Uh, yeah. Reels, I use, I just actually waiting for the Vanfords to come in. I use a 3000 size Shimano CI4 up until this year. Uh, typically it's 10 to 10, 10 pound braid to a 10 pound leader. Yep. If I'm in places that have a lot of zebra mussels and stuff like that, if I'm fishing ultra clear water, I'll drop down to eight, but I very rarely go any anything lower than eight. Sure. Just, just in my mind, I don't want to, if I do run over a zebra mussel at a six, it's going to break. I mean, mm -hmm. So I that's, that's where I'm comfortable. 10 to 10 is pretty much all the time on a tube or anything on bottom contact um, as far as spinning tackle. Sure. No, I agree with everything you said there. Uh, if you can get away with a little heavier line. I know I, I use a lot of 8-pound leader, fluorocarbon leader with, with baits, but I found if you're dragging something like a tube on the bottom consistently, even 8 sometimes just is a little too light you know you you go to set a hook and sometimes you get some break offs because of how that tube was you know buried in a bed of zebra mussels or whatever the case may be and just having that little extra doesn't seem to affect your bites at least no. that's what i found and you know you and i were out this fall and we were fishing rocks and deep cold water and i was using 15 liter that day sure and yep it, it, this time of year, that time of year, they don't care. They're eating, so they're going to eat it. They don't care if they see that line at all. They're eating what they think is a crayfish or whatever they think it is down there. So Right. When you're throwing a tube, uh, I know you mentioned there's a lot of different retrieves. Uh, I assume most of the time it's your standard drag and stop, pause type of retrieve. Do you ever utilize uh, a term that's, that a lot of northern anglers use when they're fishing a tube is, is more so drifting a tube, working, you know, using the wind to your advantage over structure. Does that come into play often for you, or is it pretty much you're casting that tube where you want that tube to go and fishing it back to the boat? Oh, weather conditions most of the time limit you to what you can do, especially in the big water on the bay. Um, most of the time I want to be casting into the wind, faced in, throwing into it, and working my bait back to me. There's times there's, you just can't do that. You can, you're just not going to do it efficiently. Mm -hmm. So drifting a tube over some structure, yeah, definitely let out tons of line and just drag it over, you know, the old school, you know, two rods in hand, each each guy's got two rods and you're you got a quarter mile, quarter mile line out. Sometimes it feels like when you set the hook, it's, you don't even know if it's a fish or a garbage bag you're dragging behind right. you, not so much line out. So yeah, there's times where you have to do that. And there's times you have to get your bait away from the boat to get bit, especially on the bay now. I mean, Sturgeon Bay has changed so much in the last year and a half, two years that you have to get your bait away from the boat now. You know, if you see a bass in North County, physically see it outside of the spawn, you're not catching that fish. Really? You're not sight fishing that indoor oh. county anymore. They're too sure. smart, too much pressure. So you have to be able to do different things. I have a mold that I modified. I took an eighth ounce tube jig and I actually filled half of that mold in so I have, it's, I just think in my head, it's like 16th ish size weight where when you drop a tube, it takes forever for it to get to the bottom, but it never sticks to the bottom either. So that bait is kind of like a goby where it just hovers off the bottom and then I'll up my line as well. In that situation, I'll up my line size. So I'm not dragging that bait on the bottom, but I'm also not 
not letting it hit the bottom, if that makes any sense at yeah, all. I can see that. Sure, sure. Well, it sounds like you got the tube the tube technique dialed in. I know you catch a lot of fish on that. Uh, as far as areas of improvement for a smallmouth angler like yourself, what are some techniques that you don't utilize but you think you should? Maybe a weakness, things like that. Is there anything that, that you can think of along those lines where, hey, I, I need to get better at this technique because I know it's effective. I just don't do it enough. Yeah, I would say for me, it's the ultra finesse type stuff. Um, Ned Riggs, like I do not like going under eight pound tests, as I already said. Sometimes you have to, and I understand that. And that's why I get beat by guys like Chris Frederick at times when, you know, the bite's really, really tough. Um, probably the super finesse. I, I do not utilize the drop shot enough. And you pick on me all the time about that. Right. I, I just don't. I It's always tied on, but it's just never a go-to for me if, for me, if I'm going to throw a drop shot, I'm usually throwing a swim bait instead where wow. I would just rather chuck and wind it and, you know, hold that bait on the level I want it. Like I said, Door County is different now, you know, sure. up where you're fishing on some of the lakes up there in Ontario, where if you see a fish, you can catch it. Mm -hmm. Even if you get over the top of fish in 20 feet of water in Door County, you can't drop onto them anymore. Wow. The fish are just too smart. There's times a year you can. Mm -hmm. The Drop shot definitely fell out of my arsenal in the last four or five years. I use it at certain times of the year, bed fishing, and obviously um, there's lakes that I used to do really, really well drop shotting a five-inch sinkhole on, on weed lines. All them weeds are gone So on them lakes, so that scenario is gone for me. I don't even use it anymore, really. Sure. Man, that's interesting yeah, how, how yeah, that's changed. Finesse. Yeah, your ultra finesse type stuff. Like I said, Ned, Ned Riggs and anything in that really, really light head. I'm just not that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the A-Rig. I'm excited to learn how you actually use that, that bait. Um, you know, A-Rig's been around for a number of years now. It's very effective. There's a lot of standard ways and there's some modifications. So, you know, without giving up a whole lot, but enough that we can get a little bit of information, because I know you, you dominate that bait. Can you walk us through you know, let's say pre-spawn through the whole cycle. And if you change the way you fish an A-Rig throughout the year, uh, let's start with, let's start with the rod and reel and the line, and then let's get into the specific A-Rig and, and what you, what type of baits you use and where you throw that. Yep. So my favorite, I've had a lot of different rods. I've, I've gone from the giant swim bait rods to a flipping stick to, uh, a, a Dobbin 744 lighter, you know, medium heavy type rod. And I, I found myself once I got shown this rod, Josh Credito actually showed it to me is a seven, seven X pride is in my opinion, hands down the best rod for an Alabama rig there is on the market. It's a heavy action type rod, but it still has that moderate bend where okay. it can take up. Cause I come off the deck when I set the hook with an A rig, it's, it's such reaction that I just can't hold myself back. So I need a rod that I'm not going to blow up whatever pound line I have on it. Cause I throw it on fluorocarbon. I do not throw it on braid ever anymore. Yep. Um, that rod is awesome. I only use a six, three to one reel. I can always speed myself up, but what I found is with the higher speeds, I can't slow myself down. I can, I can keep myself constant where I get into a, a rhythm and then I end up, finding myself speeding up and the bait rises too fast or I can't keep it where I want it. Wow. So, so a, I, low, a low ratio, really a six, yeah. three or six, two. That's, um, yeah, that's all I ever use. I don't use anything else. Okay. Greater. And I have two last year. I went to the Tatula elite. I was using a tattoo or a Daiwa zillion prior to that. And the Tatula elite is perfect. It holds the right amount of 20 pound floral. It's just an awesome rod. It's comfortable. It's light. It's cast really well. Um, it's obviously an Alabama rig's heavy, so you can launch it. But being able to launch a bait and not have backlash with a bait that heavy is, is key because you're going to lose a lot of baits if you're backlashing that line and you're going to kink your lines up and end up ruining spools of line just by getting backlashes on your cast. So sure. the rod and the reel on an Alabama rig, a lot of people don't think of because it's so heavy, you just be able to lob it out there. If you get any kind of backlash at all, you're, you're going to wreck spools of line. And you can do it quicker. I throw all 20 pound fluorocarbon. I don't ever go up. I don't ever go down. I use 20 pound in Vizix all the time. Cigar in Vizix all the time. Sure. Um, 
the rod to me is the thing that makes it so easy to fish. There's, there's a lot of guys that think, well, I can throw an Alabama rig, kind of like a musky fisherman. I can throw it for about a half hour and then I'm tired. Once you have the right setup, it's just like reeling a spinnerbait. Honestly, that's once you have the right rod that can take that load off of your shoulders and your forearms mm -hmm. while you're reeling it, it's just like reeling a spinnerbait. It's no different to me. Sure. Now, as far as the, uh, the brand of, of a rig, Alabama rigs that you, that you like, do you have a variety of different ones? Are you sticking with just a handful? I have one that, that I use on tournament day that I use specifically that I love, that I know the bait. I know how to manipulate it. I know what I can do to get it to rise, what I can do to keep it on the bottom. Um, I'm not going to tell you what that brand is because there's a million of them and it, I spent a lot of money figuring out what, what one that is. Fair enough. But there, there is a lot of really good A-rigs out there now. Um, Shane's bait, for example, is a great Alabama rig that, that you can manipulate that bait to do what you want. Um, Hog Farmer makes a great one now. Um, some of them, they just have crap components on them. That's why I just don't use them. Um, there's a couple out there that are, look really awesome that you think are going to do really well. And you get three fish into it and you break the arm off. Sure. You know, it's just the, the one that I have figured out, the one that I'm comfortable with that I use all the time. I carry 30 of them in my boat all the time. I do not ever use the, the same one twice. I'll use a brand new one for every tournament day. That's just kind of in the back of my mind. I don't want to lose arms. I don't care what kind of Alabama rig you have outside of the Strike King Titanium one, you're going to break arms off it if you're catching fish. So okay. you have to you have to have all the components you want to customize them with you. You have to have enough of everything to do it. And that's where I said earlier that everybody throws an Alabama rig. Everybody throws it all the time. They throw it everywhere. They think it's this big secret bait that's going to catch you all these fish, kind of like the hair jig was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Sure. Not the case. You got to be able to, you have to fish it. You can't just throw it out there and reel it in with Kytex on it. You actually have to fish that bait. You have to know what they're eating for one and how they're feeding. You know, there's in the spring in Door County, me and Gary will run through anybody, any bay, anywhere around and through that whole system in the spring from six inches of water to 25 feet of water and catch them around people. Mm -hmm. It's just how you, each water depth, you have to adjust your rig. You have to either throw a different rig, add weights. You know, there's some Alabama rigs I will not throw anything less than 10 feet of water because you just can't get it to, to rise. You can't get it to stay on the bottom sure. all the way back on the cast. Wow. So there's a lot of little nuances. Changing weights, weight sizes or jig sizes is probably the biggest one. So do you have a standard jig, jig brand that you use? Um, I had been using the True Bass okay. head. Them are really awesome. It's a really good hook. Um, it, the thing is, it's an awesome jig. It's, it's, I think your buddy sells that, right? Mm -hmm. True Bass? Yeah. Yep. Um, that head, I found them probably 10 years ago when I was down in Gunnersville, and they're awesome. The hooks don't jack. You don't bend a hook ever. It's got a screw lock head to it, so you get – there's days where you, you know, I'll go through five or six Kytex all day and catch a hundred fish. Sure. You know, that, that screw lock saves it. Now there's another company that, that I, I work with quite a bit, a good friend of mine, Dirty Jigs Tackle. Um, he's coming out with something that I'm going to be switching to this year. I got to see him here a couple weeks ago and I'll be switching over to them heads. So keep an eye out for them. There's a new head coming from Dirty Jigs that you're going to want to take a look at for Alabama rig fishing and just okay. fishing in general. Sure. Sure. But I like the screw lock. I, okay, I'm, screw lock. Um, I don't you know, super glue anymore. I, I don't trim the baits at all. Um, some guys will cut the heads off, flatten them, and nose them up to the back. That The true bass one is rounded, so sure. if you flatten it, it, just, it, it can move water a little different. But I just screw them on right out of the package. I, right. Super gluing is such a pain in the ass. I got sick of ruining pants. I got sick of getting super glue on my carpet, so... I, I went looking for something else, and the screw lock for me is is way better. Yeah, so I started uh, my early experience with A-Rigs. I used to use that Picasso head, which yep. I liked, especially on the smaller swim baits. And, of course, you had to implement, you know, you had to use super glue. And then, of course, it wrecks the jig head itself, um, you know, with that crusty super glue around it. And it just was a hassle. I switched over to the True Bass uh jig heads 
for most of my a rigging now and it's it is so much more efficient and those baits do stay on those those jig heads a lot better uh as far as sizes go are you i mean where are we at one sixteenth to an ounce and somewhere in between or is it yeah, standard you got to have them all um i for the most part year round i i typically don't go over a quarter on all three sometimes i'll put a heavier on one mm -hmm. uh, depending on how i want the bait to run there's there's times you want that bait to run sideways. You don't want it coming in straight. There's days that that that's how they want it. That's how the if you're on up, especially up on the bay, if they're if they're on bait fish, then bait fish ain't just always in a real tight bundle where they're just constant, you know. So sometimes you want that bait rolling. Sometimes you want it running upside down with the blades on the bottom, it or dummies on the bottom. However, however you run it. So in Wisconsin the rules for an Alabama rig as far as how many hooks, I believe it's three, correct? Yeah, it's three. And so how does that affect the way you, you rig an A rig when you can only have three hooks on it? Um, typically, obviously you try to keep them, the hooks on the bottom, the bottom three, and then either dummies on the top two or uh, blades. Some, some state laws are really goofy with blades. You can only have so many attractors. So if you throw a like uh, Shane's has blades connected. Flash Mob Juniors have blades connected. A lot of them all have blades now. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to be careful on how many tractors you have because you could be breaking the law and not even knowing it. Um, in that scenario, I just break one of the blades off, one of them extra wires off, or take the blades off of that arm. Sure. So, when it comes to blade color, uh, do you go in depth on that? Is it pretty simple? Do you keep it, whether it be silver or It depends on water purity and depth. Uh, most are silver. Most times, everyday use, it's typically silver. Um, water depth and, you know, Big Bay to knock. You want a secret throwing Alabama rig on Big Bay? You better have chartreuse, chartreuse blade. Chartreuse, sure. Yeah. For some reason, obviously, they everybody that fishes up there knows they love a chartreuse spinnerbait. And it's something with that chartreuse. Whatever they, they're feeding on for that for that presentation, they have to have it. And hmm. you, can throw one, you can throw five hooks up there. So you change your blade chartreuse and put five hooks on, you're going to fill that thing up on days. I've already right. filled up all five and done on one cast, you know? Damn. Uh, as far as, as far as bait goes, uh, as far as swim baits or whatever the case may be, what, what's your typical bait of choice for the, uh, for the A-Rig? Uh, Kytex for the most part, or some sort of swim bait. There's so many different brands out there. Strike King has some now. Everybody pretty much makes them. I pretty much stick with Kytex just because I like their colors. You know, everybody tries to copy it. Nobody can copy Bluegill Flash like Kytex colors. Nobody can copy the the Electric Shad. Electric Shad is the most diverse color there is, and everybody tries to copy it, but nobody can. So even Kytex, when they change that color, I, I don't know if you remember that probably seven years ago or so, they changed the Electric Shad, and it wasn't the same. It was crap, actually. Wow. The color was terrible. So a bunch of people complained, and a bunch of people, you know, threw threw fits, and they ended up changing it back. Okay. You know, now it's it's the electric chat it is now. So. Sure. Um, what what's your typical size? Uh anywhere from two point eight. At times, the the fats all the way up to you know four eights on one bait or two baits at times. Okay. Um, in the fall, I don't think you can put a big enough one on it. But, you know, if you if be willing to bet, I could walk out on the real shot floor, grab a seven inch Kytec and tie it on and catch smallmouth in Door County on it in the fall. Um, sure. Or at least have them pile drive it and not hook them. But right. uh, I go bigger as the water gets colder, except for in the spring. Springtime sure. is always finesse. You know, there's 2.8s on all baits some days, some days 3.3s, some days 3.8s. You, mm -hmm. you got to carry the the gambit of sizes. Right. Sometimes you make them like typically my, when I'm throwing dummies, I like to have the bigger baits on the hooks. And then my go-to for a dummy bait without a hook is the, um, easy shiner, just a four inch easy shiner. Okay. It's a little slender profile. It does, you know, if you look at a lot of the bait, if you do any research on bait fish, typically the bigger bait fish are on the bottom of the, of the bait because they're protecting above you know that's just a natural natural flow if you have a school of bait fish and there's it's full of different sizes the smaller ones are always going to be above 
Okay. So you try to match it as much as you can. Sure. So what are some memorable days you've had recently on the water throwing an A-rig? Can you walk us through as far as conditions for the day, what you were faced with, and kind of, you know, did you did you catch a bunch of smallies with it? So the this last year, I'm just thinking tournament wise, uh, I fished with Gary. Gary and I fished a tournament, the uh, Sturgeon Bay Bass Tournament, two years ago now, and we we we're on that's the A rig bite was just retarded. It was insane all over the place. Guys were catching them. Adam Rasmussen was just stroking them deep, you know, 17, 18 feet, just putting on a clinic around 50, 60 boats where. We get away from that crowd. I hate fishing in that crowd in Door County. I'll, at times you have to, but we just got out away from that crowd. And we ended up finding a fish dirt shell, and we caught them all in rigs. On so day one, shallow, six inches, yeah. throwing at at the bank and coming back to boat sitting in three feet, um, and just wrecking them. But the water had to have some color to it. So day one of that tournament, we had, we ended up weighing 20, 28 something, I think, and we were done fishing at nine 30. We just sat on the spot and just kind of sat there and bombed around a little bit. I probably only made 10 casts the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. And then on day two, on, well, at the end of day one, we ran through another area that I had found a big school in on Wednesday in practice. So I went through that. We went through there and just kind of real real fast, just kind of looking for fish to show themselves. Mm-hmm. And I kept one just under six that ended up being a, a decent call so now i knew that school was in this other area so day two we went to our where we fished day one i think nine o'clock we left there we had one fish wow and we were gonna go do the same thing the fish just changed mm-hmm. so we bailed went to plan b we weren't on plan b for three minutes and he had a double i had a double just the rest of that day was just unbelievable and we went some anglers came through there actually the johnstons came through and they gave us some they gave us some respect and they did not come in on us. They seen us catching them every cast. They were probably 30 yards away and they turned, turned the boat around and left us alone. Um, which was awesome. You know, there were some guys that came through there, saw us throwing a rigs. You see them rifling through their boat, tying on a rigs, never right. caught fish. They never caught fish. It's, we had it so dialed that whole week shallow that the way you set that bait up, that rig up is the only way they would eat it in the shallow water. It was, it was crazy, and I ended up doing the exact same thing this last this last spring too. In the same spot. It ended up. I didn't realize it at the time, but now I realize in that area why it gets there. Like I dissected it even farther, and it's all wind. Whenever the wind blows into that area, it's lights out, hmm. lights out, and it will be lights out until the wind switches. If it blows into that area for a week straight at fifty miles an hour. You're going to have wet feet all day, every day fishing in there, but you're going to catch them. You know, when it is out of that direction, they're gone. So obviously having the wind blowing into that spot, push those fish in there. The A-Rig was effective. Have you ever found, like, when it's dead calm, can you still catch them on the A-Rig? Yep. Okay. That's that's the toughest thing to do when it's calm, especially shallow. Um, Sure. when When it's calm, shallow, it's not easy to catch them they will eat it you just have to downsize you have to most times in that situation i go away from blades and go to dummies okay. and then change color whatever you're catching them on in the wind it's typically the color needs to change wow sometimes you just got to use the same color but dip the tails into a chartreuse or an orange sure okay so if you had one color that you had to use most of the time, what, what, you know, let's say somebody's just getting into throwing an Alabama rig or, or they want to try to catch a few smallmouth on this technique. What kind of suggestions could you give them as far as uh, color choice? Electric shad. Electric just, shad. Just buy three, three, three eights, and four, three electric shad. That's all you need. Gotcha. You can put a quarter ounce head on them and do everything you want to do. You're going to catch fish doing it. Um, adjusting the blade, adjusting the arms on the A rig is probably one of the biggest things that changes them baits. If you want it to rise, you got to change where the arms are. If you want it to stay on the bottom, you have to change the arms. Changing the direction of the arm. So all, if all you that. want the bait to get down in that 15, 
18 foot of water. What are you doing with that with that A rig? So let's say you're obviously if you're up shallow, you're not using real heavy weights, right? We're trying to no, keep that. Sometimes, sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. Yeah, absolutely. I'm all confused. You better <laughs> you better talk about that. Sometimes you want that bait on the bottom. Okay. No different than a jig. When a jig's coming across the bottom, what's it doing? It's stirring up. It's making commotion. It's bringing attention to itself. You got to do the same thing with an Alabama rig at times. There's like Sawyer Harbor in Sturgeon Bay. You drag that fit. You drag that bait on the bottom. Don't ever let it off the bottom hmm. in Sawyer Harbor. So some days if the wind's blowing, you have to have quarter ounce heads or three eighths ounce heads on all three hooks to keep it there. Sure. You're going sure. to snag up a lot more, but you're going to catch 90% more fish on it. Wow. That's some good, that's some good info right there. As far as deeper fish, then how are you setting up that, that pattern with the A-rig with the arms to get down? So say you're fishing 25 feet of water and you're, the fish are feeding up and you want your bait in 15 feet. Mm -hmm. You can, there's a couple different ways. If you want your bait to stay square and stay true running at you or coming in, you keel it. You either put a heavier weight in the center, center bait, depending on how you have your rig hooked or, you know, moved around the way you have your arms okay. or you put the two heavier weights on the outside with a lighter one in the middle. That will keep that bait square. And then the whole level coming back in, you want to use the smallest blades you can get away with. Blades will make that bait rise. Smaller blades will keep it at the depth you want. The bigger your blade, the more resistance there is, and it's going to rise. It's going to naturally rise. Okay. No matter what you do, just like a spinnerbait. When you want a spinnerbait to stay horizontal in the strike zone as long as you can, you downsize the blades. Mm -hmm. the smallest blades you can get. Going to dummies doesn't always do that because now you got an extra paddle, two extra paddle tails rising that bait as well. Sure. There's, a, there's times where I'll take the paddle tails right off all the baits. Take the paddles right off of it. Depending on where I'm at. Dang. So you're just basically fishing a fishing a pin minnow with no tail on it. Right. Right. The ultra finesse days when the water slicks off and the sun's high and it's tough. You got, to you got the A rig dialed in, I'm not worthy. <laughs> I don't even know what to say at this point. I'll it, stick to my drop shot. If and, and just like drop shot, and you know, you know when to adjust your height, you know when to hook sure. a bait one way or wacky rig it or nose hook it or whatever there's just little nuances that where a lot of people don't want to take the time and learn it for one it's expensive to learn when you're playing with the 15 dollar bait just for the bait without any any attachments to it any accessories on it it's expensive to, to sit and play with it you know i probably spent i don't even want to think about the amount of money on alabama rigs that i never even fished i just mess with in my garage and then take to a pond and throw to try and get to manipulate the the bait to roll you sure. know Guys that understand crankbait fishing, the same thing, where if if you're passionate and you want to fish that bait, you want to fish that all the time and be effective and compete with it, mm -hmm. you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn it. And that's why I get so mad with tournament series that don't allow it. I just don't understand it. It's it's no different than live scope or no different than the hair jig, or I always go back to the hair jig because there was a time when the hair jig was the bait you had to throw, and I got the show put to me so many times on the bay mm -hmm. where before I even knew what the hair jig was, you didn't know what these guys were throwing, and it was one after another. Well, you know what? I wasn't complaining because I got beat by it. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to learn. That drove me to find a bait that I can do that to people with, and that's the A-rig for me. And there's tournament circuits that don't allow it, and it, I don't understand the argument. Take, take all the electronics off your boat then if you think that's that big of an advantage because that's way bigger of an advantage than throwing an Alabama rig. Sure. Let me throw it with more. Let me throw it with one hook if that's the problem. If you're worried about having three baits, then let me, like Minnesota, let me throw it with one hook. I'm still going to catch them around you with it because I'm going to figure out how to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's a, that's how yeah. confident I am in that in that bait. Wow. I don't know if it can get any better than that. That was some good information when it comes to a rigging. I got my work cut out on my end. I know a lot of the listeners are probably blown away by what they just heard. So. There's a lot that goes into it, no doubt. What's your personal best smallmouth? Um, I have one that I caught. It wasn't on an Alabama rig. Um, uh -huh. That was 7'4 that I weighed. Seven, uh, there, there's a lot of fish I don't weigh. I know I've caught bigger than that. Sure. Um, they're always in the spring, and 
spring in Door County, you just really don't want to advertise when you catch something because, you know, they usually just unhook them, look at them, take a quick picture and let them go. I expect the opening weekend up there. Um, you just try not to advertise it too much. Otherwise you got every boat around, around you, you know? So I know I've caught in some over eight. I just never really, uh, put them on the scale. So sure. If you could use one bait for the rest of your life for a smallmouth, you had to choose what bait would that be? The rest of my life, any condition, any body of water. So that's all you get. You get one bait to catch smallmouth. What's it going to be? Kai tech. A swim Kai bait. A swim bait. Yeah. Just, really? yeah anybody, Cause you can take that to any body of water and catch them anywhere. You know, even in places where they're, they're eating. All in right, what size? Uh, probably a 2.8. A 2.8. Yeah. And, then what, and now we're going to one step further. So you can only use it us of one bait. It's a Kai tech, a 2.8. What's the color? Electric shad. Electric shad. Yeah. You can take it anywhere. I, Easy. I said it multiple times. It Electric shad sense. is the bait that you can fish anywhere. High sky, cloudy, raining, doesn't matter. Hmm. Interesting. Well, wow. So what do you think separates some of the top anglers in the country from others when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Uh, you know, what makes you so successful? What What is it that that these guys that consistently catch big smallmouth have in common? <laughs> they live the addiction of smallmouth. Honestly, that's what I think. Smallmouth are just different. Catching largemouth is a lot of fun. Um, I fish a lot of tournaments and we target largemouth if we have to. Mm -hmm. Smallmouth fishing is just different. It just it Travis, you have it the worst of anybody in the country, I feel, with that smallmouth addiction. You want to catch the biggest one every time you go, and you don't even want to go to bodies of water where you can't catch big ones. Sure. Smallmouth do that to you. There's more places in this country and in this world where you can go catch a giant largemouth and you don't care. Right. That's true. I don't have any desire. That's a good point. You're right. You're right. I don't have any desire in my body whatsoever to catch a 10 pound largemouth. Sure. Zero. Is it cool? Sure. I'm going to go to Mexico, you know, and, and go have a chance at it. It's going to be fun. I'm going to love it. Uh -huh. But I, I don't get goosebumps thinking about catching a 10 pound largemouth. No. I get goosebumps thinking about a seven pound smallmouth. Though. I've never thought about it that way, but you're exactly right. You, you live the addiction. That's yeah. what you do. And you are the perfect example of somebody that lives the addiction of smallmouth. I mean, who goes to Lake Ontario for a summer and guides? Right, right. Not a large yeah. fisherman, I can tell you that. Because sure. they're going to go to every other body of water around them and let somebody catch a small or a large mall. Mm -hmm. Smallmouth fishermen are just different. We're yeah. wired different. We're, you know, we look at bodies of water different. We look at everything different through a different scope than largemouth fishermen. And that, sure. like I said, I love catching largemouth, but I don't have that addiction to largemouth like I do to a smallmouth. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Well, this was an awesome interview, Kyle. I appreciate you uh, hanging out with us for the podcast here. How can people listening find out a little bit more about you and uh, as far as social media and also the tournament organizations that you run? So my socials are, I'm just basically on Facebook, uh, my Instagram, I'm, I think it's Kyle Basson. I don't even know what it is to be okay. honest. We look up Kyle Carpenter, I'm sure I'll pop up. Sure. Um, as far as social media is for business, uh, Wisco Bass, uh, or Wisco Bass .com, you'll see us on uh, our website. You'll see Wisco Bass on Facebook and then Wisco Bass 19 on Instagram. Uh, head to head is H2H fishing on YouTube, H2H fishing on um, Instagram and Facebook and then h2hfishing.com perfect for as far as all the, the tournament organizations I got a lot of them yeah. I got a lot of them there's a lot of them that are it's just busy 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 that sounds that way well good luck this coming season I'm sure I'll run into you this year no doubt Lake I'm Ontario gonna to, I'm going to try to figure out these A-rigs here this this time around because dang you got it definitely dialed in this was some good stuff all right guys there you go kyle carpenter go check out his social media kyle bassin or something he doesn't even know on instagram but you can you can check out the wisco uh series of, of uh tournaments and the head-to-head -head. all good stuff i appreciate it can't wait till next week's show until next time we'll see you guys on the water thanks for having me travis yeah yeah <laughs>
Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water. Water.